OK, good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's cabinet member on behalf of myself and the cabinet. Um, just to inform you that um, the members of the public have been uh, offered the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, no one has asked to register any questions or address us in, in relation to uh, any particular items. All the cabinet members have received uh, electronic copies of, of today's agenda and I confirm that they've all read through the report and uh, all the proposed decisions uh, within uh, the cabinet agenda today. So at this stage, I'm going to ask the committee secretary just to bring each of the cabinet members on screen individually to check we can be they can be seen and heard. Uh, and so that we can hear all the other participants as well. And uh, can I just confirm, uh, lastly, that also uh, the Chief Executive and Senior Manager team are also all present here today. Thank you, Mike. Over to you. Thank you, Joe, and good morning to Cabinet Member colleagues and everyone viewing our live stream today. Uh, just to quickly run through our Cabinet Members, Councillor Robert, is OK and hear us? Go on, Laura, just uh, unmute your mic again, just so we can make sure we capture you, OK? Morning, Mike. Yes, I can. Thanks, Laura, that's great. Good morning, Barbara, can you hear us OK? Good morning, Mike, yes, thanks. Thank you. Good morning, Wendy, can you hear us OK? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Good morning, Sharon. Can you hear us okay? Morning, Mike. Yes, I can hear you. Thank That's you. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Lenny. Can you hear us okay? Morning, Mike. All good. That's brilliant. Thank you. Barbara, can you hear us okay? Just to, do, just to double check. Yes, that's great. Mike. Thank you. That's great. Liz, good morning. Can you hear us okay? Good morning, Mike. Yeah, I can hear fine. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Pam? Can you hear us okay? Yeah, good, thank you. Barry, can you hear us okay as well? Yeah, I can, yeah, thank you. And lastly, Councillor Miller. Can you hear us okay, Gary? Yes, good morning. Thank you, Mike. That's brilliant. I'm just going to bring in uh, Chief Whip from the group as well, Councillor Bennett, who's just joining us now. So, good morning, uh, Ruth. Should be coming on now. That's great. Over, back over to you, Joe. Hi, yes. Yeah. Okay, that's uh, that's good. Thanks, uh, Mike, for that. Uh, the minutes of the last meeting were uh, uh, being circulated 28th of August. Can um, we uh, agree the minutes of the last meeting? Okay, take that. Nobody's uh, saying no, so we agree that. Uh, item number three, then, are mayoral reports that are um, none to be considered today. That are, um, there is one public recommendation under the mayoral recommendations to be considered today um, and that is basically uh, the essential uh, asset protection repair and maintenance of St George's Hall um, so we'll have seen this report where we're uh, planning on, on, on repairing uh, uh, St George's Hall doing some urgent repair works to the roof to the ceiling of the Grace Hall um, and to replace some of the paving stones uh, uh, around it as well. So basically, I don't think, uh, unless Wendy, you've got anything to say. Wendy? Uh, no, thanks, Joe. As you say, okay. it's, it's the essential repairs that need to be done. Okay, so I, th I think in terms of, um, you, you know, it's, it's just good to see that we, we are um, maintaining the hall to the standards that we, we'd expect and also doing some of the work around it. So it's great. Uh, a, a great new story in the sense that we're spending the money to get to get it done and keep it in the pristine condition that it deserves to be kept in. So can we agree that recommendation as set out in the report then, please? OK, so nobody's disagreed, so we'll, we'll agree that then. Uh, we have no reports uh, under ag agenda items number five to number eight, so... Uh, we'll move on to uh, sort of my uh, uh, announcements um, on the, the mail announcements on item nine. So I just want to make a couple of comments really. First about the uh, the launch of, of uh, North Shore. That was a uh, a great sort of uh, webinar event uh, with a number of, of influential people attending. We had uh, UNESCO and, and ICOMOS uh, also present at the webinar where we presented our plans for North Shore, for North Liverpool. North Shore 
of course, as you know, includes the Liverpool Water Scheme, the Peel uh, developments on, on Liverpool Waters from Bramley, Mock up, Bramley Dock up to uh, Princess Dock. It also includes the 10 streets and the tobacco warehouse uh, and uh, all around that particular area. So it was a great uh, event um, with a real vision and, and some um, some doc- documents presented, you know, talking about employment and, and, and training and skills and opportunities. It was also um, uh, streamed uh, sort of visuals uh, around how uh, the doc would look from across the south uh, of the city. Uh, you know, as I said, we were uh, talking to businesses and, and, and the city about the developments and the plans for North Liverpool. But we were also trying to uh, express and explain to um, UNESCO and to their advisor, Zikamos, about how much we value uh, the Liverpool uh, World Heritage Site and the buffer zone. Uh, which predominantly uh, it, the uh, North Shore is. Um, so we wanted to convince them that not only uh, what we've done in the past and how we wanted to protect our city, but also how we plan to protect our city moving forward. So I think it was a it was a good day. Um, it was chaired by uh, Michael Parkinson, um, but uh, many uh, influential people were were on the panel. But many many influential people in the audience as well. So it was a a, a great uh, morning. It was, uh, as I say, well-received, well-publicised, and I think our vision and our statements uh, for North Liverpool, for the North Shore, just complements everything that we're doing with the city plan, with the inclusive growth. Uh, it isn't the only thing happening in the city, as you, as you well know, because we've got uh, developments uh, going to take place at, at the King's Dock, at Queen's Dock, at Garden Festival site, Pall Mall, um, Paddington Village, uh, the Littlewoods Edge Lane site, uh, and stuff going on up and speak in the retail park. So um, it, it's a really um, great and exciting opportunity for us. A couple of other things, I launched the video as well uh, today. Uh, I'm, launch is probably the wrong way to use, but I produced a video and uh, gave it out talking about uh, Milvina and Brushwood care facilities and how uh, the City Council had been placed in a, a really difficult position um, because of the providers uh, of, of care within those facilities uh, deciding to end uh, their role, leaving Liverpool City Council in a very, very uh, difficult position. Uh, And for us, uh, you know, as a city who opened these two facilities last year with a great fanfare, it was heartbreaking uh, and also a really uh, devastating uh, decision uh, that uh, had to be made when they pulled out that we've had to allow uh, these facilities to uh, close and try to find accommodation for people. the city. You know, when we set up these two uh, facilities, we purchased them as the city council and leased them back uh, to the providers. And for whatever reason, and COVID playing a big, big part in that, uh, they haven't been able to uh, make a viable uh, space and place for the residents and for people. They're financially viable anyway. And that's why they, they rendered the arrangement with Liverpool City Council. We've been, as I said, in a position where we've tried to provide the answer has been a resounding no. Uh, It would cost us over £2 million uh, just to to run the facilities if we were to look at bringing them back in-house. The arrangement that we had when we built these was there would be a rental paid back to us because we borrowed the money from the Public Sector Works Loan Board. We are in negotiations with other providers about using the facility within the NHS. We're we're looking uh, at at, at least using the facilities, but unfortunately not for the people that are there in in that dementia, using and support people with serious dementia and and, and, and other uh, other issues. So it it is a a really sad uh, time for us as a city, as I know it is for 
uh, the people who have family members there, the families who have family members in there, loved ones in there, how difficult it is for them. And I just made the video to apologise to them on behalf of everyone, really, uh, as to the position that we're in. Of course, everyone knows we need to find £23 million uh, just to make ends meet this year with difficult, more difficult decisions next year. But look, I just want to make it absolutely clear that the blame for the predicament that we're in with adult social care, not just in Liverpool, but across the country, lies squarely with the with central government. Boris Johnson announced that he would sort out and solve uh, adult social care and the issues around adult social care and the funding issues around adult social care when he became prime minister and when uh, they, uh, you know, started this, if you like, uh, session of government. Uh, but we also know that they've been in, in, in power now for, for 10 years and they haven't fixed adult social care. What I keep telling people is Liverpool used to spend £222 million on adult social care in 2010. And today it's around about £174 million, so a massive reduction. We just simply haven't got £2.5 million to step up uh, and, and take these facilities on. I wish we did. If we had the money, I can assure the people of the city and also the families that it's something that we wouldn't think twice about doing that's why we set them up in the first place to actually try and help people uh, and as i said it, it's really shocking for every single one of us uh, in particular i know paul uh, paul brandt as, as the cabinet member has been working with uh, martin farron and the team to try to help families but the other thing to remember is that there was three care homes lost last year there's one already been announced recently and i expect there to be more because we've got around about 500 to 600 spare capacity places within the care sector. So I think we're going to get more and it's urgently uh, required and needed the government intervene to protect these facilities and to make sure that local authorities and cities like Liverpool have the money uh, enabling us to actually protect this type of facility. So it's hugely disappointing for us uh, as a city uh, and we regret the position that we've been placed in. Uh, and the way that we've had to respond, but we have simply no other choice. As I said, if we were to find two and a, two and a half million pound, it would have to be by making savings elsewhere. And that would mean libraries, leisure centres, uh, and other things having to close because we simply haven't the money. But uh, I just wanted to let people know that, uh, on behalf of uh, you know the council, to all those family members who are struggling and suffering. Uh, as a result of having to move their loved ones after settling them in, you know, we're, we're heartfelt, really sorry uh, and upset about it. Uh, and we support and understand your anger. Um, but as I said, we, we firmly lay the blame for the lack of finance at this government's door, not ours. The other thing I just want to, uh, in, in uh, this section in terms of announcements, and we've got Matt Ashton, uh, who's uh, uh, on, on uh, cabinet duty today uh, to give a, a bit of an update but I wanted to just talk about um, where we are with COVID uh, and the uh, infection rate of COVID in Liverpool. I made a video uh, I think day before yesterday where I put that out to uh, members of the public to residents within the city urging them to actually um, listen to the message messages that we were given out and follow the rules and the guidance because not doing so means that the infection rate will increase. What we've seen uh, in the last week is an increase in infection rates up to over 200, 300 people uh, as it currently stands today, over 300 people. That's an increase of 200 in a week from 100 the week before. And we can analyse the figures, you know, uh, and see that it isn't just uh, as a lot of people usually think that's in the most disadvantaged part of the city. It isn't. It's spread across the city and Allerton and Hunts Cross, for instance, have more infection rates than, than Prince's Park. Um, and so we see um, differences a, across the city. But what we do know is that there is a, a, a huge increase in numbers in Liverpool, a, a situation that really worries and concerns me. Uh, and I know Matt and, uh, and Tony Reeves, who've been uh, working with the other Merseyside leaders and, and um, uh, the teams there to actually try to see if we can do something concerted uh, in, in a way that gets a message across to people that we expect them to try to follow the rules. Because let's be absolutely clear, 
let's be absolutely clear that that it is um you, you know the lifting of, of restrictions that that has in my view um you know increase the infection rates because if you look at the figures today compared to the way in in april then you, you know that it there is a goes and, and and you know Sainsbury's Aldi or, or as they're all of the shops and you know people aren't wearing masks people are going into restaurants public houses or, or whatever and not wearing masks then the reality is is that infection rate will increase and that's what we're seeing in Liverpool so you know we've been positively proactive uh, you know the things that we've done in South Liverpool in particular in, in, in Princess Park where we've worked with the communities, the local councillors, you know, uh, even, you know, our local press have supported us in getting the message out. We've been able to uh, make it absolutely clear to the public in the city that we're not out the way for us. And Liverpool can't afford the lockdown. It really is, you know, Liverpool, uh, a precarious position for us. Liverpool can't afford another lockdown. And I would imagine that on the basis of the figures that I've just told you about this morning, uh, that we've got over 300 cases, that I imagine that the government will uh, put us on this watch list. But there are many, many others on the watch list uh, as we speak today. And I imagine that there will be many, many more joining us, uh, action rate increases. And, you know, I urge the government to actually do uh, a lot more in terms of proactively uh, getting a communication message out to people uh, that we need to all do more. I think Scotland uh, gives us real lessons in how they communicate every single day, how they, uh, you, you know, are ahead of the game. You know, we had an announcement yesterday from from Boris Johnson talking about marshals, uh, or was it Wednesday talking about marshals being employed in cities. We've had no contact with government. Nobody's spoken to us about our city. So, you know, I, I just think that from the city's perspective, uh, in terms of how we've handled this, and, you know, Matt's going to speak in a second, but I want to play tribute to Matt and the team. They've been absolutely amazing. But so is our team at, at the council, led by, you know, Tony and, and, and the whole team. I think we've been doing remarkable things and, and, and responding really well. But we can't manage this on our own and follow the rules and follow the guidance. Wear your masks if you're going into shops. Proprietors and owners of shops, please tell people you're not allowed in. Of course, unless you have exemption certificates. But that's the same for restaurants and, uh, and other areas. And we're asking people to follow the guidance about mixing and families not mixing over six. We're asking people to actually you know, be responsible, continue to do the things about social distancing and washing your hands, all of those things. It's only by taking that preventative action that we can stop uh, th this spread and, and getting worse. So, you know, the message is very, very clear to people, you know, uh, please follow the guidance and follow the rules. Matt, I, I don't know whether you want to just take this opportunity to speak to cabinet uh, and give people a bit of an update on the figures uh, so that people are, are, are aware what the current situation is right up to date this morning. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, and that was, that was very helpful. So, so, yeah, where we are right yeah, now is we, right we have 303 cases, cases over the last week. Over that the last is week. an increase of 100 cases on the previous week. 
and that's a rate of 60.8 per 100,000. Um, this is a very concerning situation for us because, as you've said, this has been a very rapid increase in the number of cases since the 1st of September, uh, over 200 cases. And if I take you back to where we were in July, we're having around 14, one, four positive cases a week. So a very rapid increase. We know that um, around 88% of the cases are recorded as white British, 60% of the cases are in under 40 year olds. And as you've said, this is widespread community transmission across the whole city. So there are some wards that have higher numbers than others, but actually this is across the whole city. And it is a pattern that we are seeing elsewhere in Merseyside and elsewhere in, in the country. So we're not alone in this, but it is nonetheless very concerning for, for all of us. I think some of the key messages are that if we don't get a grip of this, if we don't continue to push down levels of the virus further, then we may well end up in some kind of local lockdown, some kind of local measures um, through negotiation with government. And therefore, there are some really key actions that we all need to be taking here. Everybody has a role in this. And this is the usual public health messages around good hand hygiene, social distancing, using absolutely face coverings when we're not able to be socially distanced and i think crucially from the pattern that we're seeing around younger people spreading the infection in social settings it is therefore absolutely about only going to businesses that are covid safe so not putting money into businesses that don't look after individuals health and well-being thank you okay. chair okay uh, master i'm, I'm going to uh, take the opportunity now to to uh, see if any uh, any uh, the cabinets have any pertinent questions to to ask of either yourself or to me on on this particular issue because as I said it affects their wards as well as well as the city so um, I don't know whether anybody wants to make comments if you do just um, just indicate and, and and speak Wendy. Uh, I think our communications have, have been fantastic, uh, you know, working together, you know, with the whole team, you know, public health and city council, business, community leaders, etc. as you said, Joe. And I think even more so now, that needs to continue. I think the messages that are coming out from government are really confusing. And even for people who, you know, are keeping up to date and who are really trying to stick by the rules, you know, sort of a lot of the messages seem to contradict. So I think locally we need to continue to do what we've been doing, that all of our partners are saying the same message. We all have the same uh, communication strategy, which I know we've had throughout, but I think that's important because people are listening to something nationally uh, and we need to be clear to say that this is the message for Liverpool. You know, it worked really well, as you say, Joe, in, in, in Princess Park and, and other areas. And I think most people do act responsibly. I think it's as well, I think we need to have a clearer message, particularly around restaurants, bars, etc. that, you know, you should only be taking your mask off when you're at the table. You shouldn't be walking around freely in communal spaces without a mask on. And certainly, you know, it's those sorts of messages that would make it clearer for people because people think, feel it's OK. Um, you know, once, certainly when you're in your seat, you know, and you're eating or perhaps drinking, you know, removing the mask, but that you should not be walking around uh, communal spaces without a face covering. And I think that's a clear message that needs to go out because certainly, you know, if you're doing that, whether you're sitting in your social bubble or not, it, it, it's irrelevant because if nobody's got a mask on and they're all walking around, you know, sort of you're in it, you're in a bubble of more than six immediately. Okay. Okay. Well, well, well thanks for that, Wendy. Uh, any, any other comments? Just speak if you've got a, any comments. Uh, uh, Joe, it's Barry. Right, it's okay, Barry. I've seen your hand up all the I didn't know where it was all the time. Go for it, Barry. Okay. Uh, just just further to what you your comments about central government before, I think um you know, Matt Hancock blamed uh citizens for um for having tests when they don't need it as a to explain why there's not enough tests in the country, which is palpably not true. You know, there needs to be more testing and the government needs to provide those tests so that we can provide that security for our essential workers still and uh, and the people in the city and I think um, uh, and then the other thing as well is it just shows again that we need the government to provide to trust and fund local government and our public health to do a contact test and tracing locally because it's just not working nationally and, and that's contributed I think to where we are. 
Okay, well, th th thanks for that, Barry. I I, uh, I I don't know whether there's anybody else because I can't see any any hands being raised. But um, what what I was going to say then, moving on, is it's um, probably a good idea, Matt, and, and and I'll I'll talk to you a bit later on, maybe about about this. Is that me, me and yourself do a briefing uh, to members of the public um, uh, uh, once a week. So we'll try to set something up next week. Uh, where it, at least we can give an update to people and talk to people and explain to people where we are and what the current situation is. So we'll try to work that uh, that through and maybe work uh, alongside our local media to actually uh, publicise that, get some questions and stuff into us. So at least it keeps the awareness going of a precarious position that we, we find ourselves in because from a public health uh, p perspective, but also from... Uh, a health perspective, a mental health perspective, from a business perspective, from an education perspective, from the school uh, perspective, from you know all of, all of the components, all of the things that matter to us as a city, as a council, uh, they are important to us. And I think we need to uh, make sure that everybody gets those clear, clear messages. Okay. So um, thank you for that, Matt. And I know you've got a busy morning uh, ahead of you. So uh, once again, on behalf of the uh, cabinet and, and myself and the chief executive and stuff, whatever, thanks for everything that you uh, are, are doing and the team are doing alongside our council officers. We uh, really greatly appreciate the extra mile and the hard work that you're putting in. So thank you for that. Um, OK, let's uh, move back on to uh, the agenda then. And we go now to uh, we've got one uh, final item of business to deal with, which is uh, fully exempt. So before I uh, move uh, the uh, resolution, um, I need to end the public part of the proceedings. So can I thank those that have joined us this morning? Uh, if anybody has, uh, thank you for joining us and viewing today's meeting. So.